Our next session um, picks up on actually a very strong theme that came out yesterday um, and actually also a, a theme that came out very strongly in, in our previous discussions in the ICDA and that is uh, how do you make the ICDA truly international? So I think we'll be exploring issues of some of the scientific opportunities, issues regarding equity and inclusion and hopefully some practical ideas to really bring the I and ICDA to life. So first up, we have Nikki Tiffin from the University of Cape Town. Great, thank you. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It's really a pleasure. And to be one of um, the Africans in the room, um, holding our space with you all. So thank you for the invite. I'm going to take you on a sort of whistle top, uh, stop tour of a, a health informatics project I'm involved in, in the Western Cape in South Africa. And then I'll hopefully show you that this is an opportunity for us to turn um, what's a, currently an epidemiological data set into something that is more feasible as health genomics. So it will be quite fast, but I think there'll be time for discussion in the, in the section afterwards. Uh, so the Provincial Health Data Center is a health information exchange. Uh, the PI is Andrew Bull. Um, it's developed and hosted at the Western Cape Department of Health, so it's a government health initiative. It contains about 6.6 .6, uh, million individuals um, who access public health care in the province. The health information exchange is, um, it brings in routine electronic administrative records from all our health facilities, health platforms, and a variety of different um, electronic data sources relating to health around the, around the province. It's individualized data, so we have everything mapped to individuals. Um, from, yeah, from these many data sources. And we do have a patient master index in our province that facilitates linking, but we also, of course, have probabilistic matching and a whole a linkage algorithm that we work on. This is the Western Cape province in the southwest of South Africa. So this is kind of the technical picture of the data center. It, um, it updates um, every night, so it's updated as of midnight last night. It's, um, the, the aim of the data center is very much continuity of care. So to ensure that the different electronic platforms that currently don't speak to each other between facilities or between different types of healthcare um, are all centralized and linked together. So you can see what's happening to your patient um, regardless of the platform on which the data are collected. So it's a longitudinal um, patient journey through the healthcare system over time. So the retrospective data, it depends on the data source, can go back as far as 10 years. We collected all the retrospective data, and then obviously it's updated every day, so it's prospectively growing. On the left, you can see, I don't know that I have a pointer that works, let's see. It's always tricky to do this. On the left here, you can see a whole variety of data sources that get onboarded. I'm not going to go into the details. If people are interested, we can discuss afterwards or so. And they get rolled up over here. Um, we have different ways of bringing them in. And we have staging and holding. Some come in on the fly from digital health solutions. Other ones come in. Uh, we have a policy. We call it the make it work approach. So when people have data, we don't really fuss about what format. We just accept it gratefully and pull it in. And then what we do over here is that we, we kind of clean up the data and put it into a formalized, centralized structure. And uh, we infer these, uh, we call them the episodes, which I'll talk a bit more about. These are not electronic health records. So they're not clinical records, clinical observations. So we have laboratory data that come in from our national laboratory service who do all the lab testing, all the clinical lab testing. We get what tests were done and what were the results. Then we get pharmacy, everything that's dispensed per patient. So that comes in as well. Um, and then we have encounters. So who went to what clinics, uh, primary healthcare, tertiary healthcare, and everything in between, specialist clinics, 
disease information system, so we have HIV specific um, databases that feed in. We have an electronic uh, register because TB is notifiable, so that comes in daily as well. So all of these get mashed together and then we work out from the different types of data um, who we think has what condition. So defining the episodes is a, it's quite a complicated process because it's like a detective story. You're pulling in all the clues and working out, well, this person has diabetes, that person is HIV positive. And we do that um, in collaboration with clinicians to make sure that we, and then validation of, of the complex queries we're running. And then that runs obviously nightly as well. So every day we have an updated register of exactly who has what. So up, up until now, we've got about 14 episodes defined. We do them on a need-to-know basis, so the more common episodes were done first, and then we refine them as we go. So they are in different stages of development. And this is the end use here. We have reporting. We have a web-based or browser-based um, front end for clinicians. So when a patient w walks in, they can pull the full record in a nice sort of dashboardy approach for each patient. And then um, we have reports for facility managers who want to see who's falling through the cracks, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, down at the bottom, um, we also have, we do bespoke data sets um, where required for research, depending on consents, anonymization, et cetera. So that's just the overall picture um, of what we have available. So obviously this is kind of a fabulous uh, resource for people who want to do research. Um, there's some pros. These data are longitudinal data for all public healthcare clients in the Western Cape that are up to date as of last night. Um, we've got laboratory data with results, pharmacy, he healthcare encounters. They're updated daily. And then you, prospectively, of course, you can also um, apply to get updates. And we have all this derived information from the episodes we build. We also build care cascades. Uh, clearly for us, HIV, TB are a priority, but we have maternal cascades, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we can identify the burden of disease, identify patient outcomes, and identify gaps in care. But the cons are that this is, um, this is a provision of healthcare data resource. It's not built to do research. Research is the nice add-on that comes from providing better health care to our clients. So we don't have um, consent for research from individuals. Um, and also there are incomplete um, data, um, there are holes in the data that we know about. You know, we have some facilities that are not yet on electronic platforms. We have some complicated things that we kind of only know about because um, a lot of the people involved in this project are in the service where we, for example, some drugs are dispensed off ward stock. Um, if someone comes in with an extreme TB case and they're admitted, they get drugs off the shelf and it's not linked to their ID. So you really have to understand the data to be able to interpret the, the data usefully for research. So I've been working um, on a preliminary epidemiological data set just to understand um, the disease burden. We have a, um, a large informal settlement um, in Cape Town called Kailicha. I know it's a very over-researched data, data area. Um, so we, we collected a, we used data perturbation, so properly anonymized data, uh, longitudinal data. So this is an anonymized, de-identified um, and perturbed data set. So it's impossible to work out who the people are in there. Um, they're the longitudinal data. We took the data for anyone who attended any government health facility in the, in the area um, over a two-year period, 2016, 2017, 251,000 adult healthcare seekers, um, all the longitudinal data, and of those, 173,000 have at least one ascertained um, condition. So one of the reasons for taking this, um, looking at this data set is also to understand, and something we discussed yesterday a bit, whether one wants to go with disease-focused research or whether you can go with a disease-agnostic sampling approach and will you get enough individuals in your cohort to be able to research common diseases. So these are some of the conditions. This is not all the episodes. I just put a taster here. And CVD is obviously clearly missing, and that is because, although it's very important, our episode is not yet mature, so I can't uh, report on numbers. And just to really clarify, 
people don't go to public health care unless they're feeling really sick. It's a miserable process, you wait in queues. So this data set is enriched for people who are not well. So please don't consider that these are prevalence in the population. These are healthcare seekers there because they're not well. Most of our non-healthcare seekers are people who, have, um, who are there for maternal contraceptive care but the rest are there because something's wrong. So you can see we're working on a background of high HIV prevalence, 33% of healthcare seekers. People who ever had TB, uh, 15%, and you can see all the other figures. So our takeaway is that you can pretty much um, agnostically um, sample and you will pick up a lot of comorbidities. And I'm going to be very quick because I'm running out of time. This is just to show that our, the HIV, um, people living with HIV are being ascertained much younger with comorbidities. So we don't know what's coming, what are the drivers of these common diseases, and, and what are the needs of our aging HIV population in terms of multimorbidities, and how can we optimize health care for Africans. So the H3A Bioinformatics Network um, is part of the H3 Africa program. And it's up here just to say that we now have, thanks to the H3A Bionet, under the guidance of Nikki Mulder, an, an African-specific genotyping chip. 2.7 million SNPs, so that's actually informative for Africans. Um, so if you put these two resources together, I've got just two slides to go. Um, it's a really wonderful opportunity with the right consent processes to approach participants and to be able to link up this rich cohort um, data from the, the clinical um, data center. You can update it prospectively indefinitely without having to follow up individually if you have the right consents and hook that to genotypes from buccal swabs and really build an infinitely scalable cohort um, for future nested case control studies. So it's a fantastic opportunity. And then something that's very important um, because we w work with the government um, department is just that because we're integrated in this provision of care database, it's possible as we have actionable findings to be able to feed them back directly. So to build that bridge for immediate um, feedback of validated actionable findings. And that's a really important um, part of this process. So yeah, um, just obviously this is an intersect of some really large um, projects. So just to say, um, to acknowledge the Provincial Health Data Center under Andrew Bull's um, guidance and the Bionet. And then also my research uh, group who are also working towards the state integration. So thank you. to a panel at the end uh, for an open discussion. So um, next up we have uh, Yukinori Okada from uh, Osaka University. Welcome. Hello everyone, this is Yuki Nori Okada from Osaka University, Japan. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to have a talk at ICDA, a wonderful meeting to discuss future of common disease genetics. Uh, here's the theme of my talk today. So, how to connect human genetics to biology, drug discovery, and personalized medicine. So, everyone attending this meeting already knows that large-scale human disease genetics has achieved great achievements such as GBAS, but GBAS is a method, not a goal. Uh, even though the GBAS snp PBAR is a significant, PBAR itself doesn't cure any suffering patient. So to uh, achieve the goal, we need to expand human genetics to elucidation with disease biology, development to novel drug discovery, and implementation of personal medicine. So how should we do this challenging task in the context of global diversity? Uh, please also let me introduce Biobank Japan project, which I have been working closely for more than 10 years. So Biobank Japan project is a nationwide hospital-based cohort of Japan with phenotype and genotype data of 200,000 Japanese subjects. 
uh, which was initially launched by Professor Yusuke Nakamura. Here's the overview of the BBJ resources. And I believe that in the era of trans-Biobank international collaborations, Biobank Japan should have a value as one of the largest non-European court. And we are quite open. I'm glad to see many collaborators even within this room. And we are happy to make any international collaboration. So if you have interest, just contact us. Uh, today, uh, to achieve the goal, I want to propose five strategies as next steps of human disease genetics. The first one is transomics and cross trait analysis. Genetics is a great resource. Uh, but to elucidate this biology, genetics alone is not insufficient. We need to integrate omics data, not only within single individuals, something like much layer mix, but also across different individuals, so trans layer mix analysis. And cross trait progenic risk analysis integrate much prevision with data, could point population specific stereotype specificity of disease. For example, integration of GBUS data of 170,000 Japanese individuals, 100 deep clinical phenotypes, and epigenetic motif from 200 cell types. We can write a relationship between cell type and phenotypes. For example, contribution regulatory T cells on development of human graves diseases. Metagenome wide association study of Japanese rheumatoid arthritis patients can depict disease specific feature of gut microbiome. So we should, as a next effort, we should integrate additional mixed data, not only messenger RNA, but chip -seek, but also microRNA, link RNA, metabrome, and metagenome with a transomics cross trait analysis platform. And the second one is uh, this entanglement of complex genomic structure using next generation sequence technology. So clinically important risk variants are likely to be polymorphic and embedded in complex regions where NGS-based construction of imputation reference panels and non snv genotype imputation is effective. So for example, etiology variants in the MSG region, KRG variants, and mitochondria variants. Based on NGS-based high-resolution HRR imputation with the Japanese GBUS data, we found contribution of both classical HRA gene, non-classical HRA gene, and also non hra MSG genes on a variety of human phenotypes something like HADRB4 for asthma and C6 or 15 for type 2 diabetes. And also, machine learning based sample clustering is a very effective way to depict genetic structure of such complex regions. Here, nonlinear machine learning of the sequenced HA variants of the Japanese individuals can classify white blood cell types of Japanese individuals, but independently between classical and non classical HA genes. And the third point is linking population genetics to the evolution of the diseases. So each population have experienced population specific selection pressure, which is linked to population specific common diseases. And population genetics and natural selection pressure can be depicted in detail, especially by utilizing large scale deep organ sequence data, especially on the last past 2000 to 3000 years. Here is the singleton density score selection signature screening of the Japanese using 2000 Horgan sequence data. And such population selection is linked to phenotypes of modern phenotypes. So ADH1B and LDH2 functional mistense variants are in strong positive selection pressure in Japanese. And they have early frequency heter heterogeneous spectra even within the geographic regions of Japan. And these variants are now affecting alcohol drinking behavior and also survival rates of the modern Japanese. And also, population self selection is also linked to archaic hominins derived genome sequences such as Neanderthal. So, to understand the common disease, we need to know the history of the population. And the first point is genetics driven drug and biomarker discovery. So GBAS heads of common diseases are enriched in the genes targeted by the drugs approved for the disease itself, which strongly motivate us the genetics-driven drug discovery. So uh, here is a traditional drug discovery from a disease directly to drug, but now we have alternative methods, so disease from genomes to drugs, genetics-driven drug, genome drug discovery. 
Here's an example for the stroke. Risk genes for stroke is enriched in the target genes of the drugs approved for the treatment of stroke itself. It means that disease genetics is a great resource for drug development of the diseases. Our group has made multiple software to help these approaches, GREP, Genomics Driven Drug Repositioning, based on the list of the GBUS risk SNPs. This software picks up the candidate drugs for repositioning, and my GBUS, GBUS based serotype specific microRNA biomarker screening, based on the summary statistics of the GBUS, integration with tissue specific microRNA expression profiles, and also target gene networks. This software pick, pick you up the biobacca microRNA is insight into cell type specificity. So we should definitely integrate target gene and drug and disease network as a new omics layer. And the final point is trans and trans-biobank initiative of personalized medicine. With global biobank collaboration, with omics data, genomics, blood tests, and many things, we can predict health risks and outcome of global diverse populations. We can find candidate biomarkers which can help monitor and modify outcome. So genetics should be returned to the feedback to the patient and also overall population of diverse worldwide. As a pilot project, we are now proceeding trans biobank progenic risk score analysis under massive and strong collaboration with Biobank Japan and UK Biobank and FinGen. This study has integrated 670,000 individuals. I, feel, I wanna say thank you to the kind help from Mark, Arn, and Ben, and Alicia. And using progenic risk score of clinical biomarkers as instrument variables to predict lifespan, we can find critical biomarkers which can predict health outcomes. So PRS is, of course, effective to stratify the samples, but also this is a useful tool to predict find biomarkers and find health outcomes. Uh, this study is led by Saori Sakawe and Masahiro Kanai, two excellent students, and will be presented in detail upcoming American Society of Human Genetics meeting next month. Through this collaboration, I confirmed the potential great power of trans biobank collaboration. Uh, I believe that ICDA will be a an great platform to accelerate global and international biobank collaboration for population and patient healthcare. Thank you for listening. Thank you much. Thank you very much, that was lovely. Um, so next up we've got Andres Moreno Estrada. Um, from the National Laboratory of Genomics for Biodiversity in Mexico. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, great. I want to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation to join ICDA uh, for the opportunity to uh, present in this interesting session. Um, so today, I think, um, to introduce this interesting topic about the Mexican Biobank project, I think the starting point is one that has been already brought up several times around this uh, meeting yesterday and, and today, 
which is that the genomics field still suffers from a, a tremendous bias towards the European populations in which most of the participants in the uh, GWAS studies in the last uh, few years have been um, lacking a diversity from uh, underrepresented regions of the world. So basically, we can see that uh, a tiny fraction that has been moving, moving from 4% and now uh, is, is getting maybe this bias less pronounced but still persistent, up to 19% of, uh, of these participants are still from uh, non-European uh, ancestry. So again, this is actually, uh, I think, a starting point, a, a very motivational point for many of the projects that we want to pursue also within uh, this uh, initiative. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I could have just replaced the whole slide and just quote Eric Lander when yesterday he said, we desperately need non-European populations. So I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, and I think uh, another good point to, uh, to do an example on that is that despite this uh, tremendously successful efforts such as the uh, International 1000 Genomes Project, uh, there are still regions in the world that uh, remain underrepresented uh, or its diversity remains to, uh, to be more exhaustively uh, covered. So I would, I would mention, for example, Africa that remains to be uh, much more uh, deeper uh, represented. Uh, I also would highlight the Americas, uh, which also has a uh, tremendous lack of Native American descent populations, and also uh, the vast region of the Pacific and Oceania, which also is not uh, represented as well. But I want to drive your attention to this uh, highlighted square here, which, which uh, uh, corresponds to the Latino population sample as part of 1,000 genomes. And as you can see, they are after African population, the one uh, group that actually has the, the highest proportion of novel variant discovered uh, throughout sequencing these genomes. So as you can see, the spread of these uh, individuals is, is actually uh, uh, higher than other groups, and this is in in partially due to the fact of actual presence of admixture from African uh, uh, origin, but also the fact of uh, reference bias in the databases that lack the representation of Native American sites. So actually this uh, speaks to the heterogeneity that this group of Latino populations are. And if we take as an example, the global diversity represented in the page consortium, for example, we see uh, a cohort of uh, more than 100,000 participants with ancestors from all over continents in the world. We see that they actually cover uh, pretty much all the different um, ancestry components. Uh, and this is uh, taking references from all the continents, and in gray you see the page participants. And then in the next slide I will actually highlight only the individuals from page that are of, of, uh, of Latino populations. And as you can see here, they actually cover all possible currents of different ancestries in the cohort. So again, speaking towards the heterogeneity of this group that cannot be accounted for just as a single homogeneous group. And uh, this has been also proven to be useful not only uh, as, as a matter of understanding the diversity or the ancestry of the populations, but also it really has been helping to, the, to discover new loci that are associated with complex traits. As actually some of these novel loci have been uh, population specific to some of these ancestries, as you can see in this plot where you see the principal components of novel loci, and then you see in the bottom panel how these correlate with population specific individuals within the page consortium. So I think that it's thanks to the fact of the inclusion of these uh, populations in diverse cohorts that we are enabling the discovery of, uh, of novel traits uh, in underrepresented populations. And it's in this context, actually, that we have been pursuing over the past year several efforts to, uh, to describe at a finer scale the population structure in different regions, in this case across Latin America. For example, in Mexico a few years ago already, we conducted the Native, American, the, the Native Mexican Diversity Project in which we genotype uh, nearly 500 individuals from more than 15 different ethnic groups distributed across the country. And then our main finding is that when we extract the, uh, uh, the Native American portion of the genome of several cosmopolitan areas across Mexico and we compare them with this reference panel, we see that they're actually uh, mirror the, the, ge the geographic map of Mexico. So this is similar to what has been discovered, for example, in Europe, uh, with the difference that here there's heavy admixture in the population. So we need to extract first the, the, the Native American portion of those genomes to see this beautiful correlation uh, on a north to southeast axis that actually corresponds to the sampling location of the uh, of the individuals. So this is not only of, of, of um, population structure of or anthropological interest, we also found that there's uh, a correlation between these differences in the populations with biomedical traits. And here I'm, I'm just putting an example on lung function measure that we had access to. And there's uh, more than 7% difference of this uh, FEB value 
as a predictor for lung function between the southeast state of Yucatan and the north uh, state of Sonora, for example, in Mexico. And this is solely due to the fact of the type of Native American ancestry within uh, these, these individuals. So this is really the foundation that motivated us to embark in a different uh, and a larger effort called the Mexican Biobank Project, uh, which is a collection of more than 40,000 DNAs uh, distributed across the country. So every single state, all 100% of states are represented in this cohort, with the addition of uh, a, a much extensive panel of phenotypes available for these uh, cohorts, which is uh, what I am um, describing in the table here. So uh, besides uh, sociodemographic um, biochemical marker phenotypes, what is interesting from this effort is that we are adding a whole new set of phenotypes that are uh, serology phenotypes about the um, uh, antibody response against more than 20 pathogens segregating in the population. So we, we, uh, we expect to have a map of the distribution of the differential immune response and hoping that we find, due to the heavy substructure of the population, also what are the genetic drivers of the differential immune response to different infectious diseases. Um, this actually has uh, uh, you know, a promising outcome because one of the preliminary funds that we have been observing is that some of the variants actually segregate exclusively in the Americas, and this is a preliminary GWAS uh, on the uh, HDL levels. So we found an ABCA1 uh, gene variant which has been previously described as being private to the Americas, as you can see on the map on the left. So again, there's no way we can have uh, discovered this uh, unless actual people of Native American descent is included in these GWASs. I think the novel, uh, the novel component of this approach is that we plan to understand what is the role of ancestry given the heavy admixture of these populations in the predisposition of, uh, of disease risk. Um, again, this is novel also in terms of the correlation that we have with the older serology type that we are generating, and this is the, 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 the first non-European population in which this has been addressed. The only first pilot currently uh, conducting this type of approach is the UK Biobank data. Um, Next, I want to also highlight the fact that this whole project has been uh, uh, entirely conducted locally. So this is also promoting local capacity building uh, from the biobanking, uh, maintenance of the repository, from the genotyping has been actually conducted uh, in micro facility that I run in Mexico, uh, which I can say with a 99.9% uh, of success in the genotyping process, all the way to computing and data analysis, of course, jointly with the international uh, team of, of people collaborating in this effort. Um, I think the other advantage or, or, or outcome that we want to provide to the scientific community is a resource that will be available for public use. So this will be like nearly 10,000 individuals that can be used as a shared controls in a similar way as the uh, Wellcome Trust case, uh, case Control Consortium did several years ago and, and were uh, used in several for the publications, uh, a, a multiplying the impact and the benefit from such, a, from such an effort with a single uh, set of data uh, and individuals. And then I want to also mention other examples where we have been exploring uh, uh, with similar approaches the population structure of other uh, regions within the Americas. And I want to highlight here uh, how we can compare the population structure of South America compared uh, to Mesoamerica, for example. So this is a similar plot uh, compared to the one that I showed from Mexico, in which here we have the Native American references in, in shades of green, and then the Native American portion of Latino urban populations across different continents, sorry, across different uh, countries uh, as highlighted here in South America are in the color shades. So as you can see, uh, there's really no Latino population from either Peru, Argentina, or Chile that overlap in PCA space with the Native American uh, ancestry of Mesoamerican reference individuals. So this again speaks to the need of local efforts to describe the population structure uh, that may harbor uh, private, uh, private variants. So as an example, I want to uh, mention this cohort that we have been studying uh, in the Peruvian Andes. And this is an interesting cohort trying to understand uh, what is the uh, genetic basis for adaptation to high altitude in pregnant women, particularly because preeclampsia is a highly prevalent uh, problem in the Andes. So we have been, uh, over the past uh, few years, we have been recruiting more than uh, nearly 1,000 uh, different patients with this condition, and now we are exploring what are the genetic basis of, uh, of, uh, of this, again, in the context of the evolutionary adaptation to high altitude. The other example I want to highlight is moving south uh, another collaboration that we have been uh, doing with uh, Professor Ricardo Verdugo, who actually is also part of the ICDA here present in the audience, and, and with his team we have been um, joining forces to explore what is the population structure across Chile, and this is uh, a multi-year effort as well to collect thousands of samples across uh, uh, the, the country. And one interesting extension of this effort actually uh, on this collaboration is that uh, we are also conducting a diversity project 
in the Easter Island, which is politically part of Chile, but genetically and, and culturally very different from the rest. So actually, this is uh, 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 one of the most interesting uh, areas in the world to conduct a diversity project because also similar to the uh, um, regions in Latin America where there, there's heavy admixture, also in Israel and there are multiple components that, that, that actually uh, get together due to recent admixture from Europeans. Also recently, uh, given the, the, the annexation to the Chilean territory, there's also Native American ancestry uh, present throughout the island. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, culturally, uh, this is actually an area initially uh, colonized or settled by uh, Polynesian ancestors throughout the uh, Austronesian expansion out of, out of Taiwan uh, around three to 4,000 years ago. So uh, this is um, actually a, a, an effort that extended to be uh, larger than what we expected, and this is now uh, a bigger cohort that we are uh, assembling together with uh, collaborators in the University of Oxford. And we have now, I think, probably the most comprehensive cohort of uh, Pacific Islanders. It's uh, close to 7,000 DNAs spread across more than 50 different islands. And I think this is an ideal uh, cohort to study at a larger scale to try to understand what are the, the, the variants that are segregating here that can condition not only uh, the, uh, the population structure, but also uh, the disease uh, risk of these populations. So uh, I, I think this can be reflected also when we transform this sampling map into the actual uh, ancestry components that we find there. And as expected, we, we, we found different components coming from this Austronesian expansion, Melanesian admixture uh, in near Oceania, all the way to have a Polynesian specific uh, component that, that has also heavy uh, contribution from European and like I said, Native Americans specifically uh, or, or predominantly in Israel and due to this uh, uh, recent annexation to the Chilean territory. So we're, with this, we're exploring all different questions about the, the settlement and also about the uh, and the composition of these uh, uh, admixture contributions. But I think uh, what I want to highlight now is the fact that these admixture components at a population level can also be uh, uh, inferred at an individual level. And this is uh, for us an opportunity not only to understand the genetic makeup at an individual level where we see all possible scenarios of a, a, a Polynesian individual compared to a, a, a French a citizen that is in the island that is of course of European ancestry as you can see in red, but also to, to this uh, opportunity of giving back results to uh, participants. And this is what we did uh, in some of these individuals that participated in the study. We, came, we went back to the island and actually uh, presented their own results to the participants, which you know, make them understand more about their origins, uh, make them understand what is the genetic composition that may predispose you know, not only that where they come from, but also why they, they suffer from, from particular conditions. So I think this is also an important component of these type of studies. So finally, I think the common ground of these examples that I have been giving, I think is the fact that uh, most of these populations are the result of bottlenecks and, and serial founder effects that actually makes them to be different, even though we can uh, pinpoint which ancestral populations they, they contributed. I think uh, we can really, really find uh, uh, you know, population-specific variants that are different in frequency compared to the source populations. For example, I'm showing here just uh, this uh, uh, distribution graph where we can see that this is a shift between uh, the allele frequency of a source population. This is a case of the Mexicans. And as you can see, uh, almost half of the SNPs in the genome of Mexicans exhibit a, a, um, a more than 10% difference in the allele frequency compared to the European source. So again, this is not only about bottlenecks through the settlement of a region, but also due to recent admixture of, for example, the European component of Latino populations. Um, and again, I think this reinforces the importance and the need of, of, of local uh, efforts towards assembling cohorts that can really uh, map and, and, and characterize what is the, the catalog of variants uh, in different parts of the world. But I think also we should mention that often these uh, national driven efforts are not enough uh, to really uh, think at a global scale. So I think they are a great start. But also uh, the alliance that is uh, forming here uh, today is important to help us to also think uh, globally. And, and these are just points that I will leave them for the discussion uh, later, but I think it's important to say that thanks to this uh, uh, barrier-less uh, thinking, we can, we can really de describe the, 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 the geographic distribution of deleterious variants across different regions, for example. We can have global reference panels for imputation. We can discover population-specific variants. And I think it's important to have uh, local researchers also to be engaged and lead their own analysis as has been pointed out also uh, before. Uh, again, uh, arguing for local capacity building, both in the technology platforms that as well in bioinformatics and data science. 
Training is a super important component as well to be able to uh, create the next generation of genomics that can really lead these efforts on their own. Data sharing as well. And of course, this is important because we can reduce, uh, by reducing the European bias, we can uh, avoid perpetuating health disparities around the world. So with that, I will, I will finish. Uh, again, just to uh, give some points for the discussion. Just wanted to thank all the uh, participants, sponsors, institutions, and to you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a great talk, um, and it set up some very good topics for further discussion in the in the panel session. So finally, uh, in this session, um, we have um, Ambrose Wunkum from back to the University of Cape Town. Um, So Sambonani, in Zulu you should say Yebo. <laughs> Sambonani, yeah. excellent. So it's always good to have the last word. That means that you might drive the final agenda, which will be to establish a two million cohort of applicants. Uh, and I will try to convince you using two case scenario. I will mostly speak to implementation of genome mixed medicine itself, what happened to, to patient site, not necessarily population structure. And um, when we look at the map of the world on the front of innovation and where Africa kind of disappear because of the low investment in research, um, probably because of low investment because of uh, low resources, but this is not necessarily true because in Africa we have 30% of the resource of the whole world, in fact. So there's something to, uh, to realign some, somehow, so there. And, uh, but the competitive advantage I have of all of you here is that I have 300,000 history of human genome in my blood. And that's what Africa have as the strongest competitive advantage on this uh, forum. I would like to show two case, two case scenario, how we can use it uh, to help uh, enhancing genomic medicine in Africa, but also to help enhancing genomic medicine in the world. I'll start with the very first uh, genomic uh, medicine, uh, genomic disease, in terms of prevalence. In fact, it's the first monogenic disease of humankind, which is sickle cell disease. Uh, the reason being that it's also the first molecular disease that was described uh, that shows that a single point mutation may lead to potentially a, a severe and uh, uh, life-threatening condition. That happened with uh, Pauline. Uh, he won two Nobel Prize for that. The second reason I need to start with this is that I came from a tradition of strong researcher in hemoglobinopathy. Um, there is a question mark on what is my contribution, but I'm still working on it. Um, sickle cell disease occur in 300,000 new baby in the world, and 80% of those baby are born in Africa. This is a common disease, it's not a rare disease. In Nigeria, for example, 2% of children at birth have sickle cell disease. So it's important that our definition of common disease be fluid, because it will be context specific. This will be a rare disease in the context of the USA, but it's a common disease in the context of Africa. This disease uh, is the consequence of a mutation of the beta globin chain, and this mutation distort the red blood cell. Instead of having a round shape, they have a banana shape. They are sticky and they are rigid, and the consequence is anemia, the consequence is organ destruction, the consequence is short life expectancy. How can genomic medicine help? Genomic medicine can help at least as three levels. The first level is primary prevention that can extend to early detection and genetic diagnostic before birth that we introduced, for example, in Cameroon in 2007, in South Africa in 2010. But we all know that this would lead to serious uh, ethical concern. So the second level is secondary prevention. 
that probably where sickle cell can help complex disease. I will try to spend a little bit more time on this section. Sickle cell disease have been known to modern medicine more than 100 years ago. On the left hand panel is the first description of a patient uh, in America. For the past 30 years, the mortality in children have decreased for two reasons, antibioprophylaxis and also the use of hydroxyurea. But the mortality of adults have not changed over the past four decades in America. <coughs> not at all, despite the best care. And why is this? Adults will die before of chronic and acute cardiovascular complication. And these chronic and acute cardiovascular complications are also the main killer in the general population. Stroke, kidney disease, uh, heart disease, pulmonary conditions. And all these acute and chronic cardiovascular conditions in sickle cell disease are subjected to genetic variation. For example, kidney disease, we know up to now that four genes will con 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 control a little bit the prevalence and occurrence and severity of kidney disease in sickle cell disease. We can imagine that there are more above those four genes in uh, the genome of sickle cell disease patients that still need to be investigated. The second, stroke in sickle cell disease. Uh, this Bayesian model was proposed a long time ago, but have not been tested in real life, in real cohort. And what is uh, beautiful in this Bayesian model is that there are some genes that are specific to sickle cell disease. Uh, it's those genes in orange, and there are those that are also common in the general population in stroke. My argument is that if you want to investigate stroke in sickle cell disease, you don't need 20,000 patients. Even in with 2,000 patients, it will be enough to target and determine some variation that may be also relevant to the general population. Sickle cell disease is also the best model, to my view, to explore uh, transomics. Uh, uh, for example, in these cases, uh, that shows that specific transcriptomic can predict mortality in sickle cell disease. We have some few data on microRNA. There are some evolving data also on metagenomics. And let's imagine that we can combine that in a group of patients that have a single mutation but that present very differently. Once again, that will inform how to take care of those patients, but it might also inform how to, uh, to take care of patients that have similar complications in the general population. I think this slide is a slide from uh, Dr. Green, and that shows uh, the uh, genomic architecture of, of genetic uh, disease. Uh, the classical model is a rare disease, a simple monogenic and Mendelian, more common ones are complex multigenics and non-Mendelian. In fact, sickle cell disease is the both of both worlds. It's common, it's monogenic, and it's complex at the same time. It's definitely the perfect model. So I'm inviting you, when we establish this cohort, two million cohort in Africa, we need to have a subset of that cohort that will be monogenic sickle cell disease, and that we will need to follow for a very long time to address some of these questions. Let's move to the last uh, point how can genomics have sickle cell disease, the treatment? Uh, we, genomic can help in two ways. The first thing is classical pharmacogenomic. Most sickle cell disease patients have to take medication for a very, very long time. Recently, we did a very, very simple experiment with about 1,200 uh, genes, about 5,000 markers that are commercially available as pharmacogenes, and that, in principle, are involved in the metabolism on 80% of drugs that are available out there. When we compare the markers in sickle cell disease patients, the first row, the control from the same population, and uh, the, from other population in the world, clearly you could see that all the African population in the thousand genome looks a little bit similar, but they're quite different uh, uh, from those markers in the, all the other population in the world. If we zoom in terms of minor allele frequency, here, in African population, clearly, specifically for marker, uh, for minor allele frequency in low frequency markers, all European population, not, not European, South European population, European Americans, are very, very similar, but very, very different from African population. What does that mean? It means that pharmacoscan that is commercially available might not lead to the best result in Africa, might not even be relevant. That also means that there are opportunity for all these 1,200 genes, probably to sequence them all and perform new pharmacokinetic uh, genes among the African population to have a product that would be relevant for all population. Clearly, we cannot use this in Africa at the moment, just based on this preliminary data. 
I know that the strongest modifier of sickle cell disease is fetal hemoglobin. A happy Guillaume is in the room. And if you have high level of fetal hemoglobin, you live much longer. We know that this is controlled by specific genomic variation. And one of the genes that are involved in the control is a transcriptional repressor of fetal hemoglobin called BCL11. You more remove that gene in a mice model, you cure the mice model for sickle cell disease. And this is the basis for intensive, intensive a therapeutic, new therapeutic exploration in sickle cell disease that also involves gene therapy or eventually uh, gene editing. One of the problems in fetal hemoglobin genomics is that the study that, have been, that we perform uh, on the African continent on our patient clearly indicate that the non-variant or the non-loci that we know will explain only 20% of the level of fetal hemoglobin. Where are the other 80%? And uh, taking advantage of H3 Africa Consortium and the availability now on data from Africa by Africans, I, I have to remind you that we have four biobanks in Africa through H3 Africa Consortium. In those, in fact, three biobanks, one in South Africa, one in Nigeria, one in Uganda. In those biobanks, we have up to 50,000 50, samples at the moment with variable type of phenotype. And using uh, the first 350 genome, that was sequenced from the continent, a specific uh, chip for GYs uh, that is African specific and rich with 700,000 uh, selected markers was used. And we rerun recently uh, GYs for fetal hemoglobin in sample of, of uh, sickle cell disease from Cameroon. Uh, the QQ plot looks uh, great. Uh, and if you look at the very, very first analysis, I didn't, I was very hesitated to show this because it's very, very preliminary. I have not even yet. Um, check every single thing, but uh, I've shared with Guillaume, and then there are a couple of uh, loci already that we seems to identify that make some uh, biological sense there. If this is confirmed, and this, if this is correct, that means that by using a simple, small sample size on population from Africa, it might be possible to have one or two hits uh, that may be important for next therapeutic manipulation. And the next meeting, I will show you definitive data and I'll show you some more data that I'm hiding now. So, so if we look at these uh, other genes, uh, this other study that shows that in the reference uh, sequence now genome, we have 10% of uh, content that are missing if you are looking of African DNA. And this is only 900 genome from people in around here, from Caribbean people. So I would imagine that we will have more and more if we take a genome from African uh, living in Africa. And why we should do that? This is a recent uh, uh, data from Charles Routimin that by using African population in this diabetic study, they identify one specific genes that are important for diabetes predisposition. And the, the marker that they found here is, mon is monomorphic in Europeans, in monomorphic in Asian. So even if you have one million Asian American for this, you would never have found this marker. Remember, I have 300,000 years of history of genome than everyone in this room. <laughs> so that means that in my genome at the moment, there are specific markers that have never moved from Africa. If you have one million European, one million Asian, you're not gonna find them. Two million cohort is the first way to start in Africa. So the second story I would like to tell, I call it unknown is exome database. Please, Chair, can you give me more time? I'm coming from very far. So, um, uh, excellent. So, um, so I'll, I'll speak to the genomic of, of hearing impairment. Once again, this is a common condition that may appear somewhere else. One in a thousand in America, six in a thousand in Africa. And in this condition, if you are born with hearing impairment, 50% of the case, this is due to a genetic cause, and most of them is a recessive cause. Sometimes you are hearing payment will show up with, someone or with something else, like this eyes, uh, specific color eyes issue in these in this two uh, young Africans, is called Vardenborg syndrome. Sometimes there's nothing to see, it's called non-syndromic. And if you have non-syndromic hearing impairment as European or Asian, 50% of cases is only two genes that will explain why you are deaf. But if you investigate 180 genes associated with hearing impairment that we know now, among Africans Ni from Nigeria or from South Africa, black South African, the pickup rate is only 4%. You do the same in African American, pickup rate is 25%. If you compare it to 70% in Middle Eastern Am uh, African Am uh, 
American. So, but if you narrow the selection and only select those that really Mendelize in families, as illustrated in this study that we perform, you still have 30% of these families that are not explained by using uh, the panel sequencing that we have available. That means that at least in 30% of families that segregate hearing impairment in Africa, we are able to discover novel genes. We tested this hypothesis by taking only a couple of families, uh, run them through whole exome, and identify these novel genes, uh, confirm in a mice model, uh, by deleting the mice model, the mice the gene in the mice model, the, the mice is deaf. So what we try to convince uh, most funders is that if we need to look for novel genes for hearing impairment, you have to do it in Africa. Two reasons for that. The first is that we know using transcriptome data from inner ears that at least 100 novel genes still need to be discovered. We also know from the data available for the past 10 years, there is very few novel genes in hearing impairment that have been discovered by most of the lab. Most, many things that have been reported in the four main lab working in this is novel variant in non-genes. Uh, clearly, Africa is, is the next frontier. So we've been doing that uh, for the past uh, three years. Probably we have the largest collection of hearing impairment families in the world at the moment from, from Africa, more than 1,000 patients at the moment. And we have run at least 150 whole exome uh, in families. And why is it important? This is important because we will be able to enrich the panel that is available with novel genes. Most important, we will be able also to enrich the database that are available with variants uh, from the African continent. Of course, this is not charity business. This is the only way science have to be done. Uh, this is an example where the low representativity in a specific exome database have led to poor diagnostic outcome for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if we, a simulation shows that even a small proportion of African was present in the database, this will not have happened uh, in this specific case. So this is a historical slide. It was our 16 years uh, younger. Uh, this in Bar Harbor, but the most important person is the guy in the center, uh, uh, Professor Mark Krisik. And uh, Victor Mark Krisik at the time showed this slide, uh, once again, prediction, prediction, and he always anticipated 16 years ago that we will have, because of non-representativity, because of not involvement of the whole world in genomics, we will have probably international tension. Probably his view was justice and equity. But I hope to have shown with a few data that the idea is not just as uncritical, it's just uh, the imperative of scientific uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, hopefully, I hope I've convinced you that if we need to have this strong building on human genome, we need to enrich the foundation with more variation from African population. If we don't do it, it will still work, but without Africa, there is something that will never work. And these are the things that we have been trying to do in various projects. In our hearing uh, uh, impairment project, we are working now in six different African countries. Hopefully, at the end of the project, we will have enough resources to enrich with diversity also uh, the exome uh, database with data from Africa. In our sickle cell disease project, we are working in four different African countries. We have a proof of concept that we can establish a cohort now that have 10,000 sickle cell disease patients that we will follow for many, many years for now. Uh, in our uh, incidental funding project, we have explored what should be returned in Africa, and uh, you will be have, have available very soon in the next couple of weeks. Uh, uh, the way we see a return of result in genomic research in the African continent. We have three tiers of genes uh, that will be uh, available in the public domain very soon. And in another project that we call uh, Deltas, we are trying to build capacity in at least four different African countries by establishing human genetics program, but also bioinformatics program. I would like to thank you for your very kind attention. Thank you, Chair. invite all of the rest of the panel speakers up to the panel and we have about 20 minutes for open discussion so please if you've got questions um, line up at the microphones but I guess first of all um, to get the conversation going um, you know I think I think given the, the, the nature of the discussion over the last couple of days I think it would be fair to say that people recognize the importance of um, global diversity in terms of the populations that we're, that we're looking at. But, so I, I would like to ask each of you what you think the ICDA can do to help 
make that a reality? What are the barriers that need to be overcome that the ICDA can help with? And um, start with Nikki. Here we go. Um, thank you. Yeah. So um, I th I think that as Africans we have a great opportunity, although we st laid out the starting blocks. I think we can learn from from what's been done before and actually leapfrog um, forward and not maybe go through the same uh, learning curves that the rest of the world uh, researchers had to go through. So I think that that's a great advantage, that by collaborating we can, we can avoid some of the, the learning curve and reinventing the wheel. Um, but I also think we just have to be really open about the fact that uh, working from our perspective in Africa is not the same as working in Europe or in North America. So some of the ethics considerations are quite different, benefit sharing looks different, agency of participants looks different. Um, so that doesn't need to be a barrier, but something that we need to be cognizant of and, and um, open to. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I think uh, ICD will be a great platform to cover global diversity. I think this is because global diversity became more complex than we previously expected in two ways. The one is previously in the half of the era, the diversity means Asian, African, European. But now, if Africans so many population, not only East Asian, South Asian, Middle Asian, so the diversity is become expanded and also even in the single population, we know that there exist many minor subpopulations. So recent developer machine learning methods can identify them. So diversity is really important, but very difficult task to cover. So in this case, a systematic international collaborative network is very important to achieve this purpose. So in this sense, I, see the, uh, I think it will be a good opportunity to do it. Andres? Yep. Um, is this a this one? Yeah. yeah. So no, I think this is a, a great opportunity to uh, uh, equilibrate the, uh, the capacity across different regions of the world because I think uh, having a common goal and, and putting together resources and knowledge is not only about contributing to the, to the global assembly of, of data or, or, or researchers, I think it's also a, a way to communicate back to each of the regions and strengthen those capacities there. So, so I think um, with this ambitious goal of going into a very detailed level beyond maps, and which is mechanism and, and even uh, drug discovery to uh, potential applications, I think there's also a, a, a potential risk of, of, uh, of um, uh, persisting bias towards having just a subset of the diversity of populations going all the way to that level, right? So I think now we have the opportunity to bring uh, many diverse regions and different backgrounds to work in parallel towards that goal uh, more like in an equilibrated way and not just like uh, with a subset of human diversity. Okay, okay thanks. I think uh, there, there are two, three things to do. The first is we are already doing it. Uh, it's probably advocacy. And I hope the presence of your presence here uh, speak to that. And advocacy will happen at three level, uh, the level of funders. It will happen also at the level of institution leaders and uh, most of them are in the room. Uh, the second is a stakeholder and project mapping. Um, and uh, probably we need to know what is happening everywhere else uh, globally in terms of major genomic projects that are happening. And third, identify the gaps that will allow to have at least one or two flagship projects that are achievable, that can be measurable in the next uh, five years. I think the, the, the com this group can help driving that. I mean, do you think that there's a particular challenge in advocating for foundational um, data sets across various populations where maybe the, the health impact might be not quite so obvious in a short term? I think it, is, it would be hard to say there is not be challenges. I think genomics investment is always expensive. Uh, the reason why I'm speaking to a flagship project that is achievable, uh, that focus on one specific area, maybe one specific disease condition, and specifically in disease of high burden, if they if, if the need to be. It doesn't seem to me that it's difficult to convince that we need diversity in genomics at the moment. It's how do we do that mm -hmm. uh, somehow, the reason why we probably need to focus. And how we get it funded, yeah. yeah. So I'll turn to some questions from the floor. And Thomas, then Thomas Lena, NIMH. I have one comment and one question. The comment 
may go better in the afternoon session. But since in addition to uh, Sorry, can you get closer to your microphone? In addition, ah. in addition to global population diversity, uh, we should not forget the large population centers uh, on both coasts of this country that have large immigrant uh, communities that are currently insufficiently represented in the cohorts that we have in this country. Uh, and we should make an effort to include those. The question I have is for Professor Wonka. Uh, I've worked a little bit in, in, in Africa. How would you, what are the barriers to put such a large cohort, two million plus, together? And uh, do you think of those in Southern Africa? Do you see, are those the disease specific, uh, is there a disease specific focus or is it a general population cohort? Uh, I think the, probably the first thing is not to reinvent the wheel. Um, H3 Africa project have been running for the past 10 years. It is an extremely well coordinated project. It's a project that have established at least three biobank functional broadband. It's a project that have established a few codes for complex disease that have up to uh, 20,000 patients at the moment. We probably through that project have established also a regulatory and governance uh, rule on how to manage the data and the sample somehow. So probably is to, is to leverage on that. The African Academy of Science is another office that have a lot of experience in federating fellows and researchers on the African continent. Based on those two organizations, we all know where are the weak links in terms of national regulations. We all know where they link regionally. And if we now need to capture the diversity that we want to capture, we have to be in, in all the region. We may need to have a center of excellence in Southern Africa, one in East Africa, one in Central Africa, or one in West Africa. I agree with you that it would be critical to go where things work and where the system works. In West Africa, we know, for example, at least by the experience, that if I'm working in Ghana, I have a peace of mind. System works very well. If I am working in Kigali, in Rwanda, I will not have any single problem to implement the research that I'm doing. So we, we have to identify that. But I know that at the moment, we, because of the past 10 years working on the field, um, before coming to this meeting, I was, the Africans, I was at the meeting of the African Society of Human Genetics. I'm the president of the organization. The organization has been there for the past, uh, since 2003. And this is a vibrant group of geneticists that have been meeting every single year, despite the challenges. Remember, Mali is red on the map of the NIH, so no single NIH member was there at the moment. But we were still there up to 150 African scientists uh, discussing genomics. So, the mapping of what is happening, we have some kind of idea and where it works better and where it works less better. Nikki, you wanted to come in and now? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we have a great genomic resource in H3 Africa so far, but I think what we're lacking there is in the, um, the health data and the health informatics. So it's been done very much as a cross-sectional study. There are only one or two studies that even have follow-up. And I think um, an area that we could really add value within Africa is working th with governments and um, in the provision of health care. If we can help to build good electronic health care facilities and platforms, that feeds the research um, endeavor, but it, um, it, it's also more sustainable in the long term. So to run follow-up studies in, within Africa I mean, I'm generalizing, but it's quite tricky to follow up your patients um, any length of time, to have repeat visits, and to get a full non-disease specific um, health record. So even within H3 Africa, um, the projects are pretty much all disease focused, and you don't get um, a view of the comorbidities or the other events that go on in that person's health profile. And I think particularly there, we really have to be cognizant of the comorbidities. Uh, it's a huge um, issue. People don't present with one disease. So I think that there's a, a very big gap in the health records that we want to link to the genomic data. And I unfortunately don't think H3 Africa can answer that. I work in the health informatics team trying to harmonize the data. And the data that have been collected are not comprehensive. They're very disease specific and they're not necessarily harmonized across the groups. So I think we have to think very carefully about the clinical data and how those are going to link in. Sir. Yes, thank, you for, thank you for some uh, great um, presentation. So uh, clinical and phenotypic data are generally uh, difficult to harmonize even within one country and even more difficult across countries. But 
but the socioeconomic data are sort of one, um, um, it's even much, much more difficult. So uh, yesterday, uh, many speakers touched on, on this, that this will be one of the sort of next step in, in, in many of these projects. So, so in your areas, how would you uh, go about collecting socioeconomic data and to what extent does it make sense? Of course, you, you represent very different areas, but, but could you add some comments on, on those data and how they actually also could play a role from your areas? So shall we each yeah. comment? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we've looked at collecting socioeconomic data from um, our um, healthcare seekers in the government health service, and we realized that it's pretty much a low flat average. Um, there isn't a huge socioeconomic differential uh, in people accessing government health care, and it's not a meaningful metric. In fact, uh, I often say it that essentially most African uh, participants who come in through the health, uh, the government healthcare sector are vulnerable in one way or another, um, and, and often that's socioeconomic. So I think within our context, it's not necessarily a useful metric. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with you that socioeconomic factor is a very important factor in human genetic studies. So previously, we didn't try to link socioeconomic factor in genetics, but we now notice that uh, genetic, for example, in the obesity, obesity is affected by socioeconomic factors. The social factor itself is also affected by disease. So in this sense, it is very really important to systematically correct social factor. Of course, social equity factor is difficult to be coded and difficult to be translated between biobanks, but I think we sh need to start some efforts how to be collect the social equity factor to enable in the genetic study. So I totally agree with your suggestion. Yeah, very quickly, uh, in the Mexico Biobank, for example, we, we do have SES status as part of the questionnaire that was uh, collected uh, through the National Health Survey. And, and, and we see that it's uh, highly correlated with the ancestry, for example. So the, given the, the, um, the profound admixture nature of the population, we see that it is correlated with uh, higher SES status with the European ancestry and lower socioeconomic status with uh, uh, Native American ancestry, for example. And this is, this is, this is true for many other um, um, ethnic Latino populations throughout Latin America, which is something that has been consistently reported uh, by, by us and many others. So, so yeah, it's definitely just something uh, that we need to uh, take into account. Would you have anything to add? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll take a concrete example. In our sickle cell disease project, we started by doing what we call a sickle cell disease ontology project which is a controlled uh, definition of the vocabulary that we use by all the scientists in the field and hopefully and outside our network. That sickle cell disease ontology is already available online, so if you type now sickle cell disease ontology, you should be able to access it. Within the sickle cell disease ontology, we had a specific working group that was also inspired by Phoenix uh, program uh, from the NIH to define clearly what are the socio-demographic determinants. It took a lot of time to clean up that, to try to align it internationally, to give a specific reference number for each specific definition and how it's defined. And based on that ontology, we, we now build our database that is also available now, uh, on which we could be, let's say, hopefully compare the data that we collect from all the sites and hopefully uh, for, for, for other, other projects as well. We applied the very same on our hearing impairment project. We started, first of all, with an ontology project based on our experience sickle cell disease. Once again, that ontology is available publicly. You can, you can consult it. It's a machine-based uh, 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 reference where every single uh, definition on how you measure it is uh, properly written. Of course, it's a living uh, instrument. We will have to refine it as we go. Just, just get close. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, Sarah Medland. I work in Australia at QIMR Berkhofer. Uh, so working in a geographically isolated uh, part of the world, as compared to most people in the room, we have quite a lot of bottlenecks around uh, resources that I think uh, people in Europe and North America don't have, and I think some of the panelists might have this experience as well. So things like uh, uh, computational resources and uh, internet cost to download some of these wonderful data sets um, are really important considerations uh, for people who don't work in the US or Europe. And I think part of a consortium like this is to help, uh, could have a role in help facilitating and making things 
uh, maybe more accessible and perhaps providing some increased access to computational resources and, and those kind of things. And I was wondering what people thought about that kind of idea. Good, great point. Andres? Yeah, no, I think it's, a, it's a, uh, a very important point that I relate a lot with because uh, I think in our experience, uh, and, I, uh, and I speak about previous international efforts we have been a part of, like Thousand Genomes Project and many others, I think the most challenging part of those uh, contributions have been how to bridge the gap between uh, under um, um, served areas. I'm not only speaking about healthcare under served, but in terms of uh, capacity, technology, training, and, and how to, because people is deeply interested in these kind of things, but, but still uh, to close the gap is not as easy to keep up with the speed that the whole consortium needs to really deliver on the, on the uh, promises of the project. So I think it's the most challenging thing to do to uh, really uh, try to, br to bring people and capacity up to speed. And this is actually a responsibility not only of researchers or consortium, also you know, commercial distributors, right? So because only you just prices of, of the same technology or the same reagents put in different places of the world cost twice as much or three times more, which just prohibits the whole advance of science there as well. So I think it's a global thing that it's uh, really challenging. Eric. Oh. Um, I, I'm very enthusiastic about, about the ideas, like a, a cohort of two million Africans. Um, and I like the idea of leapfrogging. But I think a very important aspect of leapfrogging is to ask, what is the purpose of the cohorts? I was just writing down the possible purposes. And there's a very large number of them. Foundational genetic resources, so you characterize the genetics of a population. New locus discovery, fine mapping, which Africa, I think, mm. will have real special contributions to. Um, epidemiology, like in the UK Biobank, being coupled to this. Uh, mechanistic research, using polygenic risk scores to find patients mm. so that we can do this kind of research, not just in Western populations, but find predisposed patients. Attracting clinical trials by identifying patients who have particular genotypes or polygenic risk scores so that clinical trials are done in the first instance in such populations. Application to public health. Infrastructure building. Capa human capacity building. And experimenting with using health systems rather than random signups as the locus of new kinds of cohorts. So I have a list of at least 10 possible things you might be choosing to pioneer and leapfrog or do with this. And my guess is it's hard to do all 10 well. So the question really, uh, or perhaps just the suggestion is, I think in each of these cases, each of these areas of the world, it will be important to convene groups of stakeholders in the region and also experts from outside the region to talk about what are the distinctive contributions that can be made. Ten years ago, it was enough to just collect genetic variation in different places. That alone was very informative. But to really take this leapfrog idea seriously, they have to have a theory of the case, a theory of action around it. And I'd be very excited if in 2020, there were convenings in a couple of parts of the world that tried to de define things that truly went beyond the existing studies and pioneered something new. Because I think to the extent that you do that, you will also find it easier to raise resources. Or we collectively, because we're all in on this, will find it easier to, to raise resources. Great point. Yeah. Chile. Yeah, I kind of wanted to reiterate a point that I mentioned quickly yesterday in my own presentation of, of creating EQTL maps and other similar functional genomics resources for interpreting genetic associations that are discovered in non-European populations. And, and I think that uh, there are analyses and studies ongoing to kind of figure out exactly how, how the differences in LD actually kind of how, how well these things translate and what, what are the optimal study designs and do we actually need to redo GTEx in like 30 different populations across the world? Hopefully not. But, but I just wanted to kind of raise here one point where ICDA can have a major role and, and actually develop transferable, consistent protocols for biospecimen collection across multiple cohorts across the world. 
yeah, I think that's so. I would it. That's yeah, I would agree. I think um, we're just waiting for you to work out how to do it, and then we'll <laughs> take the end product. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's uh, that's why we need diversity within the work working groups, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just also wanted to quickly address the, the point raised about the infrastructure and internet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and to really um, just uh, champion the work that's been done by the H three Africa Bionet, because actually we've largely addressed those things. Um, within a, the African network in a pan-African way. And we have new clusters, uh, you know, new servers, internet protocols for transferring data, et cetera, et cetera. And if um, people are ever interested in understanding how we did that, we'd be happy to share all the information um, so that other people can leapfrog on what we've developed. In fact, often the problem we have as a Bionet within Africa is people assuring us that we can't do stuff that we know we can do very well. Very, Thank. Pra very practical help there. Finally, um, Rory. Uh, Rory Collins, Oxford. One of the things that Dr. Estrada, um, Marino Estrada mentioned was the, um, uh, the value of uh, global reference sequence panels for imputation. Um, in Africa, in, in his case, uh, Mexico and, and South America, uh, but also, of course, in the two biggest populations in the world that, that have been mentioned, China and, of course, India. Um, uh, that would seem to me to be something that uh, was also identified as a key need uh, at the meeting uh, in Iceland of the 100,000 uh, cohort consortium uh, that would actually produce a big improvement in the ability to use genetic data in these populations quite rapidly. So if I can address that, at H3A Bionet, we're actually running a, we've started running an imputation service because some of the um, genomes that we used for designing the, the chip are not um, consented for general use. However, we can use uh, those data to run an imputation service. So if people are struggling to do imputation for African genomes, that's something we can help with there. Uh, I just want to my quick point is, I also want to ask to share the, this global reference panel for the community. Because for game sequence data of global populations, of course, very really informative to the genotype imputation, but it has much more information which can do many kinds of aspect analysis. So I think this kind of reference plan should be constructed, but also shared between the com community. Mm -hmm. So uh, just very quickly, Nikki, I think that's a very important point because uh, that could be a, a proportionally less you know, cost effect, sorry, like less costly way to, to benefit the, the use of existing data because uh, with a proportionally lower cost of sequencing uh, a, a few or, I mean, a, a big enough, but still like a, a fewer number compared to the available data that is out there already, that is mostly on, on microarrays. I think this would be a way, uh, a good way to leverage the, the, the use of that data, which is already pretty big. Um, but I think a big limitation is also the lack of reference panels for imputation. So, yeah. so yeah, imputation uh, service would be a, a good idea. So even when we were building the chip, um, you know, a lot of people had genome or whole exome sequence that they couldn't release for general use um, because of the way it had been collected and consented. But it's a way to lever, lever those data in an ethical way that doesn't expose participants who haven't agreed for the exposure, but still make those data relevant and practically applicable for, for everyone else. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So we are running five minutes over, but I'm going to allow a final point. I'm very sorry. Final point from the uh, back there. Thank you. Um, so I just did want to pick up on what was said at the panel. So um, I think. The uh, differences in pricing and access to pricing of, of chips and reagents and things has a huge impact on the ability to do diverse work across the world. And I think coming together in a forum like this, you know, if there is a mechanism to also start working on how to make that more equitable and how to uh, help facilitate access to these things would be uh, a wonderful outcome of this type of meeting. Thanks. Uh, I totally agree with your opinion. Uh, I think. We have the data much more than we can analyze, we can interpret. So in this case, a number of the people who can access the data increase, the output and idea is also going to increase. In this sense, shower up with the data and make uh, barrier-free access to all over the world community researchers is a very, very important issue. Coming from the UK where the pine doesn't buy you very many sequences now. <laughs>
I can, I can, uh, 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 it's, it is an issue. So I think without any further ado, we will break um, for uh, coffee. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll resume the next session. All right, thank, you. thank you to everybody and all the speakers. Thank you.